The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to the Quirky Dog Podcast, inspired by some of the quirkiest dogs you can ever imagine and the owners who love them. This podcast is brought to you by the quirky couple themselves, Scott and Jess Williams. Their aim is to educate and entertain. Here's Scott and Jess. Little late to the punch on the Instagram post, so we got that real quick. Welcome, guys, and happy Wednesday. Today, we are going to be talking about how control creates calm. And just as a precursor by control, we do not mean that everyone listening needs to go out and buy a Dogtra 200C to create control, or you need to switch from a harness to a pinch collar or anything else. Control of any sort. So that's the theme today. We're going to talk it out for the next half hour, but first we're going to start with the quirky tip of the day. And just on a side note, Are you going to talk I'm about not your cigar? big on control. Oh, yeah, I not. do not or like control. If we're going to be open and honest, shape, way or form. if we're going to be open and honest today, he's not real control. big on calm either. Control is a little demon. Yeah, so, and it is, and this is something that our dogs often don't like either, right? A strong dog isn't going to want control. I thought he was going to talk about how his cigar was bubbling up, but his wrapper... I don't want to give a poor review on a very good cigar (laughs) that just happened to have a wrapper explode He has a little cigar trouble, but that's okay. Scott wanted to do the quirky tip should be uh, try an edible, but we're not going to do that. But if you do not not have a calming practice (laughs) for yourself that you practice... I don't even care if it's twice a year. Like we'll like I we need to do it now. Like we um what is it called smudge smudging? We have sage. We bring it through the house. We smudge so every so often. Scott and I float every so often. He just did the infrared sauna this weekend when he floated. Just did a four day fast. He just did a fast. We fast. Um, if it's exercise, if it's sitting quietly, we meditate most mornings. Today we did 15 minutes, everything else. If you do not have some sort of a calming practice, and I honestly don't even care if that's sitting in your car with phone on airplane mode for two minutes once a month, try to implement a calming practice because the bottom line here is the more calm and steady that we can be, the better our dogs can be. And dogs are really sensing the energy of the world and the energy that we provide and everything else. So we're going to talk about today how controlling dogs actually will help calm them down in the long run. Yeah, and during these winter months, you could try the Wim Hof method. If oh, yeah. you're not familiar with that, just take off all your clothes, go out in the snow, roll around in the snow for about five minutes. When you come in, you're going to be very grateful. <laughs> yeah. Very I grateful know. that I don't it's know nice that's and warm a calming, in the house. That's more of a tempering uh, <laughs> modality than a calming modality. But even that kind of thing, challenge yourself, push yourself a little bit. And that's what we say even all the time about the dogs, the building mental toughness and all of that, it all ties together. Healthy stress. So, yes. So part of this is that I am seeing... And we are seeing more and more and more from various aspects of life, these dogs that appear to be really mushy, I would say, right? So they're, they, they appear to be very soft and they appear to be like, oh, please don't say anything. And maybe it appears that they were abused in a former home if it's a rescue or whatever else. But they appear to be kind of little wallflowers, if you will, not kind to say like, that rudely. Like snowflake dogs. Yes, snowflake dogs, sure. So they appear to need really delicate handling and everything else. Some of those dogs that have that type of behavior and that are trying to show the owners or the trainers or anything else, like, I can't handle any stress. It's really hard. Some of those dogs are actually the strongest dogs. Sometimes that is a way for dogs to tell us, like, hey, please don't make me do anything. Everything's too much and it will be too hard for me. But once you start putting a little bit of control on those dogs, even if it's as simple as holding a sit when a dog passes, successfully holding a sit, all of a sudden they're getting braver And they're appearing more calm. They're appearing less frenetic in their energy. They're appearing less stressed. They're appearing less fearful. They're appearing less whatever. So that's one subset of that. And then also these dogs that are just super high energy, right? Like they're just powering through. Um, We have dogs. We have dogs. We have dogs with a lot of drive. We have a wide uh, gamut of dogs with their temperaments, personalities. But just on that first dog you were talking about, uh, it's interesting because these dogs that you say are pretty strong but act really weak are usually very intelligent. So yes. they have picked up 
yes. somewhere along what the line. Works. Oh, if I cower here, yep. they stop doing stuff. So that's yes. just their go-to. They just start looking more and more pathetic until finally everybody leaves them around alone. They don't do anything that they don't want to do. Or if they vocalize, if you even if you say like it's and, and just to tweet it apart a little bit more. And this isn't the main focus of this, but if you do have a dog out there that's like this, maybe Scott or I on a return will do the exact same thing. We'll take a dog's dog on the leash. We'll put it right in the crate. The dog goes right in. If the owner goes to do the exact same thing in the exact same situation with the exact same equipment, we're not even talking hitting a button on an e-collar, the dog will scream just because the owner is saying, is making the dog do that instead. The dog is trying to get people to back away <clears throat> and back off. And what Scott said about intelligence, it's totally true, right? Like people who are very smart, they know how to survive. They know how to keep themselves as steady as they can for their own mental health. And they're just constantly like seeing ways of, okay, I can make it work if I scheme it this way. Dogs are the same way. They're very intelligent. They remember experiences throughout their whole lives. What worked, what didn't work, everything else. And similar to what we say about intelligence, dogs with intelligence are going to have more drive. And the more drive you have, the more prone that you are to have some anxiety, right? So people like that are salespeople. There's a lot of people that like can go and go all over the country and sell, 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 but they're kind of more on like the higher end of like functioning, right? Like they're vibrating maybe a little higher than everybody else. These people are very intelligent. Maybe they're also more prone to anxiety. Be mindful of these things and how you are as a person and how it may be reflecting on your dog because we see it time and time and time again that when the dogs know that someone is in charge, they just become calmer almost immediately. Very quickly. Yeah, and uh, it, it even happens so quickly, even if Scott's doing an in-home, we talk about this a lot, so the first thing for our in-person business is people now will pay 147 and Scott goes out, or 199 if they're farther away, and Scott will go out and do an initial evaluation with them. The dog could be crazy, reactive, barking, never able to hold a sit, anything else. Scott's able to establish control with that dog within five minutes. Now, granted, him and this dog don't have a real history of not listening or anything else, but as soon as that control is established, the dog becomes calmer, which is why then people want to continue to work with us. Yeah, and quite often people get a lot of results that, that move on past that initial, like they see me one time. And the dog is better later that night. Yeah, that one lady I talked to today said the dog's been great since you came here. It's amazing. One session. But they're also implementing some, some things that I showed them. So yeah. the dog is getting better. Yeah. So if you feel as though you're not able to control your dog in any instance, which I'm not judging. We're not judging. Like that may be the situation right now. I would challenge you guys to take out a pen and paper and write down situations which you could start to control your dog. So maybe it's going through the doorway. And Scott has a good list that we're going to get into here also. But maybe you just control them as they go to potty to go outside. And maybe that means now they get a leash on before they go outside or something else. Maybe you can control them in the car. Just pick one place that you may be able to implement control if you honestly feel like you have zero control anywhere. I know a lot of people get very fearful like that the front door will open and the dog will run out. That's always been a sign of anxiety that we see, like a dog just constantly wanting to run, wanting to go. They don't know where to go. I'm not saying that your first thing that you should try to control is a recall in that setup, but I will tell you right now, any of the dogs that we own, if they ran out the door and they had no equipment or anything else, they would turn around and come back to me. So that is an aspect of control, but I'm not saying that that's where you should necessarily start. Start in one spot in your dog's life, in your dog's routine, where you can implement a little bit of control. So let's do your list, because you had a yeah, lot of good ones. I was going to say, uh, rather than think about where you can implement control, it'd be easier probably to make a list of where you feel you're losing control. Or where, where you, does the dog go crazy? Or where you don't have control yeah, anywhere. Every time somebody comes over, every time this happens, the dog goes crazy. That's a good place to start, because the way you're going to implement control is to be proactive before those situations happen. What can I do to try to head this off so it isn't complete pandemonium? And I would argue that some dogs out there are only controlled when they feel like they've been fed enough or they've been walked enough or they're sleeping. And other times the owners are honestly trying to cater to them, whether it be in the middle of the night or when they're on the phone and then the dog's barking for attention. Like there are some dogs out there that you may not know how to control them in any way, shape, or form. So let's let's try to work through some of these issues together. Yeah, and that overfeeding, I mean, it, it sounds like it could work. But when you get a dog that's like 300 pounds now, it's even harder to control them. Because yes. once they go, they're now dragging you. They they're, using, they're using their weight. Yeah. So I have um, just made a quick list here. Uh, times when I would think it's a good time to control your dog. 
and it's when they become reactive in the crate. Say you're crating and something caused that dog to just go crazy barking and having a temper tantrum. That would be a time that you want to yeah. or if your dog and stop that. Behavior. Or if your dog always barks when the FedEx truck comes or always barks, especially we're talking about in a crate here. I would recommend crating your dog to lower reactivity. If they always bark when the mailman comes, if they always bark when they're in the car, maybe think, all right, I'm going to crate the dog in the car. And then I'm going to put a visual barrier up in the car because the more the dog is constantly blowing up in the crate, the worse it could be. But this is an example of maybe a dog that's always fine in the crate and then becomes reactive just out of nowhere. That's a sign that maybe you need to start controlling the dog a bit more. Maybe when the cat walks by the yes. crate. That's when the dog blows up. Every yes. time the cat walks by the yes. crate. So that's a circumstance of where you should come up with a plan to implement control. Yeah. Um, going through doorways and transitions. We've talked about this many, many times. But again, every it happens so frequently that... Um, uh, I just had another dog that is being highly reactive on leash with other dogs in public. And uh, I said, okay, put the leash on the dog and let's take the dog out. And this dog has some training and the people have a little bit of training. And the dog immediately, when they opened the door to their apartment, the dog went right out ahead of them and they didn't even notice it. They were just kind of oblivious to this. And I said, okay, hang on, stop. Go back in the apartment because the control starts when you put the leash on. So... We got them, the dog did not come out of the apartment until it walked either with them or they went out first and then brought the dog with them. And then it went to walking ahead of them down the hallway. I said, stop that, back the dog up. The dog has to heal with you. And then we got to an elevator and put the dog in a sit. And I knew what was gonna happen. I said, as soon as this elevator dog o uh, door opens, the dog's gonna jump right into the elevator. And sure enough, as soon as the door opened, the dog, because of the way they've been handling the dog, thought, yeah, this is where we go in, and just got up and broke the sit. And so I had to work them through that. Well, what happened was by the time we got through all of these little transitional periods to get down to the actual outdoors, I took dogs out. The dog was not reactive at all because the dog's head was in a totally different and space. And that's less about Scott holding the leash or the owner's holding the leash. They more the leash about the being mindful. Yes, that's more about being mindful of transitions. And I do kind of want to even pull apart the transition thing a little bit more because we do talk about it a lot, but like transitions are everywhere, right? Getting into the car, coming out of the crate. That's why Susan Garrett's crate games is so amazing. If you do not have a routine for your dog coming out of the crate, if your dog just flies out of the crate when they come out, that is your first transition before you go into a ring to trial, before you bring the dog outside to go to the bathroom, whatever. That's the first transition they're experiencing. The door where they go outside. The, another transition that always pops up with us is the bed, right? So a more anxious dog, when you walk back in, we always want to walk back in to release the dog. So the dog's anticipating us coming back rather than flying across the room, especially early on in training. Very often, the owner will walk in to go release the dog off the bed. They pick the leash up, and the dog just kind of gets sucked off the bed with them because they're close to the owner now, and they want that interaction again. That is a transition. Our podcast has transitions. Sometimes the music gets a little bit screwy here or there, and when the transition is a little bit off, then it kind of will affect that next segment. Same thing as live theater. It rarely happens. Good girl, Chrissy. No harm to Chrissy. But same thing as live theater. We have less live theater now. If the transitions from one scene to another, something happens in the middle, one of the props didn't come down, then maybe that next scene has a few bobbles there. The, the actors have noticed it. Something wasn't correct. Anything else. Transitions are everything. In transitions as people is where we're not thinking at all, right? We're just running out the door, lock the door. Oh, shit, we forgot our keys. Like we're just always trying to get to where we're going. But if you focus on the transitions that you experience with your dog for your dog's sake, we guarantee you, you will see a lot more calmness in their behavior. All right, let's uh, go another, to- Another big transition that I just thought of is uh, daytime to nighttime. That yes. sunset time when the dogs get the zoomies. Yes. And when it says my dog gets crazy, and, you know, what time of day? Well, it's around 6.30 or, you know, and it could be a combination of that's when the whole family is finally in the house together. The kids are home from school. They want, everybody's kind of hungry. But also, the one thing that's the same with every dog is it's right at sunset. It's right when that sun is going yeah. down, the moon's coming up, 
and all of a sudden the dog starts getting really excited wanting to run around. And even when he talked about that, I would even say the transition from just going to bed sometimes because if there's going to be the aggression on the couch, let's say, like we hear that quite often, I wake him up to go to bed and he gets crabby. That then later on will turn into daytime naps and it progresses into more. But that's like the first, he's fine all day, everything's fine, but when he's asleep on the couch and I go to wake him up to go to the crate, he gets aggressive. That's a transition from when we were going to be awake all together as a family to when we were going to go to bed. So if there's holes in any of your transitions, transitions are a good place to lean in and start. Okay, we're going to go to break. Reactivity. And when we come back, we're going to discuss more about how you can control the calm. Does your dog lack self-control? Are you looking for some answers? Would you like your dog to be calmer? Does your dog lack confidence? Canine MindShift. Enroll in a free course today. Simply go to caninemindshift.com. That's caninemindshift.com. We're back with seamless transitions also. Very nice. See how smooth it goes with the nice transitions? All right. So let's go to the next one. Uh, The next one I had was when uh, you're walking past people or other dogs out in public on the street. It's a time when the dogs can get reactive and crazy. Yeah. And really, it's interesting the clients that report back or that initially complain about leash reactivity Because we're in a situation right now where I'm taking dogs out to go to the bathroom. I take pet dogs outside to go to the bathroom. So if we have a dog that's 60, 75 pounds, the very first day I'll say to Scott, hey, bring this dog of ours through just so I know what I'm dealing with. Because I don't want to get caught off guard in ice at 6 a.m. that that dog's leash reactivity is really severe and maybe I'm going to get dragged across the front yard. I want to know a baseline of what that dog is going to look like with me. And I would say 75% of the time the dog does nothing. Yeah, it's a new handler, and they're not and, being reactive. And maybe part of it is the pattern of the owner stressed, and they're pulling up on the leash, or it's a relationship with the owner. So a lot of the dogs that have this leash reactivity, we haven't even seen before, but it's happening with the owner. If it's surfacing again for you, that is a sign that the dog is lacking control, maybe in the transitions, maybe in the clarity of loose leash walking, somewhere. If the leash reactivity is popping up in any way, shape, or form towards people, towards dogs, that is a control issue. It's a control issue, and I think that it's a dog that is being controlled by its own instincts, and it's not using any self-control. It has no respect for its owner. It doesn't the owner is not making the dog feel safe, or maybe the dog you know, the dog feels a need to protect the owner. There's so many different things that are going on there. Yeah. And I tell people, you need to work on your control before you can give the dog freedom. Yeah. And I tell everybody, I don't expect anybody to heal their dog all around the neighborhood. It's too long. The dog isn't going to pay attention. The people aren't going to be able to stay focused for 25 minutes healing. It's not realistic. But you need to get a good uh, heal with your dog as an exercise so that you can then let your dog be loose on a leash so you can go for a nice leisurely or walk. Or just so you can enter the vet, right? If you had good criteria with loose leash walking, at least you could get to the car to the vet's office on a loose leash. And when Scott says he doesn't want the client to heal the dog the whole time, when the dog isn't healing, they're not dragging ahead yeah, on whatever to... equipment they're wearing. They have the whole six-foot leash, but they're still respecting the bubble of the leash. A the leash, leash being on the dog does seem to, it should signal that they're implementing some control in some way, shape, or form. And that doesn't mean it's because you've been very compulsive with the leash. The leash should be something that the dog thinks like, oh, okay, like I'm wearing the leash now on the bed. You have another layer to control me. You have another way to control me. If the leash to your dog is just about a happy walk, maybe that's not a sense of control. And I know that a lot of people listening may say like, oh my gosh, my dog's so reactive. There's no way If you have been working on loose leash walking for over six months with any trainer, with any piece of equipment, and it has not gotten better, please go find a new trainer. Because loose leash walking does not take us more than three to five days with any dog we've ever worked with. That's just the bottom line. And I'm not expecting other people to be able to make that happen. And if you're listening and you don't want to have a trainer and you're thinking, well, I have a lot of leash reactivity... Even something as simple as being able to sit in the driveway while a dog passes on the street. So we're maybe talking now like, what, 40 yards of space in between. If your dog can't even do that, yeah, if your dog can't even do that, then your dog's certainly not going to be able to walk past a dog on the street. So start small, but start with control somewhere. All right. One thing that really helps uh, with that type of behavior when you have a dog that just has a real strong habit of 
um, pulling and being reactive. And I know that there's a six foot leash law in most towns all over the country and probably the world, but I like to take a 15 foot leash and um, go on a loose leash walk with my dog or any dog because quite often with a six foot leash, people are wrapping it around their arms six times. Now they've made it into a three foot leash or a three and a half foot leash. There's really no room for the dog to walk on a loose leash. And with a 15 foot leash, it's interesting when they start to all of a sudden feel that freedom where they can get out and not feel that tension, they naturally start to slow themselves down. And I tell people that I just pick these arbitrary percentages. 20% of the time should be militant control through healing. 80% of the time should be a loose leash, enjoyable walk. In order to enjoy the 80%, you gotta have a good strong 20% so that when you come up and see a dog up the street, you can put your dog into a heel, heel past that distraction, and then release them again so that you can go on your nice walk. Yeah, the good loose leash walking and the good healing, and this isn't focused healing or anything else, this is just criteria of being next to someone, is so when all the other dogs are being assholes, your dog can still be safe. Because if there's a dog pulling towards you and your dog's pulling towards that dog, you're at risk of injury, your dog's at risk of injury, and everything else. The next one that we want to talk about is when you're about to feed them. Um, This is, I would say that this is the telltale thing that clients say, oh yeah, he has a good sit-stay because the routine of sit, stay, put the food down, and then you release the dog. But that's the only context of a sit-stay. But feeding is a transition regardless. I hear I hear two stories typically. One is, oh, my dog has a great sit-stay. Every time when I do this feeding routine, he sits, I put the bowl down, the dog doesn't move till I release him to the food, which is a great little behavior to have in your pocket and something you should do with your dog. But the alternative I hear is, the dog is jumping and knocking the bowl out of my hand, and it's a complete shit show when I'm trying to mm-hmm. feed my dog. Those are the two kind of ways And you need to implement some control there. If One, if the dog is barking at you to eat and you're getting up to feed it, please stop that hard stop no matter where you're listening from, what's going on. I really don't care. That's what I do with my dog. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> and <laughs> oh, when he Jimmy wants to come hungry. in from going outside, he barks, and you say, hope. Better get up. Yeah, better Jimmy jump up. Jimmy needs something. Not a joke. We're living it too. But legitimately is that. <laughs> At least I'm aware of it. That's that's a big part of it. And Just Jimmy's being aware the of hardest dog to control in the home. <laughs> he needs okay. six e-collars to get uh, a compound. He does not. But Scott, <laughs> that is the free pass. Oh, it's just Jimmy. Oh, it's just cute. I implement control in those setups. Anyway, if the dog is barking at you, <clears> you get up and you're like, okay, yeah, I'll feed you. Here we go. That's an issue. If the dog... The precursor to walking over to the food bin is when the dog starts to get excited. Think about how you can change that. Think about how you can change that behavior. Maybe you teach the dog to wait in the crate. Maybe if you don't have a crate, you put the dog outside for the last potty and you're preparing the dog's meal while they're outside. Think about quelling the crazy before you feed the dog because otherwise you're just reinforcing the crazy every day of your life. And lately, at least twice a day, because a lot of people are feeding twice a day, sometimes three times a day, sometimes more than that. So consider your ritual around food. Can I just add to that? Mm -hmm. One thing that we do seriously with our dogs and the feeding is that we're not consistent in the way we feed our dogs. And and that part of that is because we're busy, we're doing things. But the thing is that our dogs don't always know where they're going to get fed. Typically, it's well, in a crate. Little Bop, Sometimes, little Bop is pretty. Little Bop is pretty clear. I can throw my dogs under the bus, too. Vital is pretty clear that if she hears a bull, she will bark and say she would like to eat first. She is pretty clear that <laughs> no matter what the routine is, she would like to be the first one fed. But I should be managing that then and bringing it down. But Scott's right. Yes, sometimes routines screw you up. But even if you have the same routine... They should just be calm and shut up. My dog is, isn't really comfortable eating in the kitchen out of a bowl on the floor. <laughs> he's, he's been eating out in his crate for so many years that when we put the food on the, on the floor, he's like, what the frig is this? He and says he, that this is happening in the dog ate breakfast in the kitchen. I'm not saying he floor, won't do so. it, but yeah. it's a little he, different. The, but that is a, good, that is a good point where he may see a transition. If that gets sloppy, if Scott's walking past his bed to feed him, he may just want to go fly into the crate. If, if the dog's going to get off the bed there, Scott will say, hey, get back on the bed. And he waits until he says free and gets him into the crate to eat. If, if I that- have a bowl of food in my hand and my dog's on the crate, uh, on the bed, if I sneeze, he'll run to the crate. <laughs> he must have said he, it's he time won't. to go. But be conscious of <laughs> feeding and transitions. Okay, going back to the house. What about the house? Control there. Oh, yeah, I tell people. If you're out, I mean, going back to walking down the street. No, just coming back to the home is another place where we should be. When you've been out with your dog, a typical time when the dog is going to anticipate what's going on and then get overstimulated is when they're within a a house of your home. They're excited to go home. They see your house, and now they want to pull because there's my home. 
I think or they're the, on the front walkway. Whatever it is, that things thing, can fall apart. The worst thing you can do, and so many people do this because it's easier, they drop the leash. So many people have told me, oh, I just dropped the leash. The dog runs right to the door and waits for me. You're letting your dog just burst and run you're setting you're setting the tone of wherever you were maybe you were on an errand maybe you were getting a puppuccino maybe the dog went to the vet you're setting a tone of coming back to the house any structures off any rules are off anything else yeah now you know, with that said i'll say that what i do i haven't done it all week but i walk with sink on the road that is sink is um 10 years old right now she's going to be 11 next month She's in great shape, everything else, but I'm not going to be wrapping her around cones doing this. So I take three pound weights, I tie her leash to my belt, and I like power walk on the street with her. When we get back to the house- and you look damn good doing it. Thank you, love. So when we get back to the house, I have really good control the whole walk. Anytime a car passes, she sits and she's on the side of the road, anything else. I tell her to sit in the front of the driveway, and especially if Scott's out or something else, I'll just let her off her leash to run. And she does. I say, I, she does the whole walk. We do it perfect. We do about a mile and a half. I'm go, go, go. Normally, I'm even sweating in the winter. We get back. It's been good. I let her go. You know what else I could do in that moment? And maybe I'll even do this this week so I can put it on the Canine Healing Facebook page and so people can see. If I tell her, sink, sit, and then I say free, and she starts running to the back thinking, oh, maybe daddy's working on his weed plants or having a cigar, or maybe Jimmy's out, and she gets all excited. I could call her halfway in between that, even if Scott was sitting out with Jimmy or he was working on his plants or he was even playing ball with one of his dogs in the field. That one I might have to work a little bit. If she was running towards that, I could say, sink, come, and I could break that pattern and I could have control. And I have seen that several times. I've been working it like I've had a pet dog on a dog bed sitting out in the backyard having a cigar and Jess will let her dog off leash. The dog just starts running towards the pet dog to say hi and Jess will call her dog away because the dog isn't ready for that much And I don't even know that he's the dog's necessarily out there, but yeah, I have it. control of that situation. So if you have amazing control and the, I don't know how many people listen on the podcast that have the level of control that we at least expect out of our dogs and our client dogs. Hopefully more than we think. <laughs> Hopefully it's starting to rise up yeah. in this country somewhere. But if you have that kind of control, fine, like throw it out the window. I, I understand there's exceptions to the rule. But if you have a control issues, if you have behavioral issues and you're allowing this bullshit to happen, don't allow it to keep happening. And I will say that the great paradox of putting a tremendous amount of control on your dog is that they can have a ton of freedom. Yes. That's the beauty of it. You can let your dog off leash anywhere you want. And you call them, they come, if you see there's a problem, you call them, put the leash back on them. We do not, when we go hiking with our dogs, we don't really even talk to our dogs, honestly. We just kind of let them go. If anything, we say go. If we go to the beach or we go hiking, we're telling them to go. Take your toy away from us or go sniff. They want to be interacting with us. We're like, go run, go be away. But we're not calling them, telling them anything. They're up ahead, however many feet or yards or whatever. And we see somebody, hey, come here. We put them on a leash. We evaluate how that other dog is. Maybe we just let them walk past on a loose six-foot leash. If that dog's blowing up, we're probably going to put a lot of control on them. If that dog looks like it could hurt them, we may body block and put our dogs in a down. But we... We're not telling our dogs to do that much. Like we're all just kind of like living together and family members together. They just know to listen because we do have ways to control them. Yeah, and we were the last time we went at that public. It was like a national park or something. There was a walk we went on through the woods, and it was posted: dogs have to be on leash. And of course, um, so I let my dog drag the six foot and just run and be a dog. But then I saw a lady up ahead with a little dog, and she saw my dog and freaked and picked up her little small dog because she probably has had some bad experiences with other dogs. I called my dog right back, picked up the leash, we walked by. She was so relieved because that's not typical. Usually it's yeah. a friggin' shit show as a- And it's just out of know. respect, right? It's the same thing with runners. You guys, all runners aren't afraid of dogs. I know dog trainers who are runners that like keep a wide distance from dogs because runners freaking get targeted. Dogs see that and they're running. Be courteous to other people. Just because your dog's friendly doesn't mean your dog should be able to go check out a runner or a bicyclist or anything else. All right. And then the last one we're going to talk about with maybe there's a lack of control and times you want to implement more control is when there's more activity in your house, right? So 
you have people coming over or there's going to be young children coming over. Scott always says, you know, holidays are the biggest time for bites because people are paying less attention. There's more stimulation than normal. Or maybe the people that you have over are trying to overstimulate your dog. No, they're, they're really infatuated with your dog because yes. they don't have one because so, they don't want the responsibility. Or they, this is how they are with their dog mm -hmm. and their dog is 120 pounds and jumps on people and knocks them over and chases dogs down in the neighborhood. I'm not sure the situation, nor do we really care. But these are times when if you do not have control, you're not going to have calmness. And if you can't have control in that situation, that's 100% fine. People come over to our home. Our dogs are in crates. People don't even know we have dogs half the time. If they're friends of ours, we'll have a few dogs out on beds after a few minutes of them being out. Maybe they're loose, excuse me, in our house while they're over. But we don't have all of our dogs out when people come over and expect complete quiet and complete control and everything else. And frankly, if our dog's friends walked into our house out of nowhere, our dogs would jump on them and greet them. That's how we deal with our dogs. That's how we treat our dogs. That's what we allow from our dogs. Conversely, if it's a person that isn't one of our friends and just someone else over, they'd be on a bed. When they were released from that bed, they're not going to jump on them. We're setting them up differently. So let's talk about some ways that they could like manage the dog for people coming over well, one, or young kids or something else. One thing I tell people all the time, and they, they're so preoccupied with the person on the outside of their house yes. that they're like, oh my God, I, the yes. person was or at the, the door. They have to come in. Yes. And I tell them, or the delivery person. Not I even don't if, care yes. if the doorbell is yes. ringing. You can go to the door, say, yeah. one minute, yeah. take that dog and put him in another room, a mud room or a, a crate if you crate your dogs, but certainly manage the dog first. And then deal that the people come in or take that package or do what you have to do rather than risk having the dog escape from the home or aggress towards the person or just be a, such a pain in the butt that you're just sitting there apologizing. I'm so sorry. And you're getting, I'm so sorry. You're getting another rep of this frenetic, crazy energy, right? Or this reactivity or whatever you don't want to have. So manage it differently. If you know someone's coming over and you don't want to do it right away when Scott says put the dog in another room. It can wear a drag line. We've talked about drag lines before on the podcast. Or it can be dragging a leash. Have a way that you can quickly create control. If they're in a back room and they're barking, maybe put them farther away. Maybe have a crate in the garage. If you're ethically open to it, maybe put a bark collar on them in the crate. Whatever it's going to be, but create it so it's not chaos. Because just hoping for the best thing to happen, then what? Now the dog bites a six-year-old niece of yours, that's an issue. Now the dog gets out the front door because UPS was delivering a package, that's an issue. Now the dog, you know, pees when someone comes in because it's so fearful and it's cowering behind you and everything else, that's an issue. We personally, and I'm almost has tears in my eyes saying this, we personally do not want our dogs to emotionally ever be in that state where they are so fearful that they would want to be behind us hiding and we have dogs with good genetics, but depending on how we raise them, they could be dogs like that if we weren't proper. We want our dogs to be confident. We want them to be feeling safe in the situations they're in, and we want them to know that we have their freaking backs. So we're not going to let some crazy person into our home that's going to run into a corner and make them feel uncomfortable. With that said also, I would say if somebody came to the house that I didn't know who it was, I'd bring Vital out of her crate, and I'd go to the door with Vital because I know I could get some territorial barking. I could with Cousteau. I don't know if he'd have follow through. I don't know if there'd be fear. I don't know anything else. But yes, there's a certain aspect to that with dogs. But just our normal golden doodle and everything else, you guys, if every interaction where people are entering your home, it even happens with family members, right? People have four kids. Every time one of the four kids comes home, the dog's going from zero to 120. So now you've had maybe the husband comes home, the wife is maybe working, and the kids come home all at different times. That's six instances of the dog rushing the door, barking, even if it's a family member, and then everybody else, calm down, calm down, it's okay. So manage it differently. People coming into your home and people leaving your home, that happens a lot, actually. I just wanted to add, Go not ahead. to interrupt you, but I just did a first class with Caroline and Tony up in Shapley, Maine. Wow. And Caroline starting to call out our clients. put a sign on her door that said, do not knock on the door. Oh, You're going to make my dogs crazy. Good job. They're all going to start barking and it, it turns into chaos. Good job. So I walk up to the door to do a class and uh, I texted her. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> I, I see the dogs there. Good I don't want to create a sh chaos. Yeah. I text her. She comes. She opens the door. Everything's quiet. Yeah, so she managed that differently. And way to go. I didn't even hear that tidbit. People leaving is the same thing. How frequently does someone say the dog's totally fine until the stranger gets up to go to the bathroom? The change in the room gets the dog aggravated again. Or the people go to leave, and then they nip on the back of the leg. If you're having these types of things happen 
over and over and over again, then set it up so it's going differently. Because if you control your dog, your dog will be calmer. I, I don't know how else to say that. You don't have to control your dog in a mean way in anything else, but if you're just managing your dog on a harness and you're just covering your dog's crate while it's reactively barking or it's rolling a soft tent at a dog show over because it's being so reactive, you're not controlling your dog. Your dog's being a dick. It's okay to be mean to the people though. Uh, you don't even have to be mean to the people. You can be clear to the people. Look how well her sign worked. You yeah. think her best friend comes over for coffee or Chardonnay or something and she knocks on the door? No, out of respect to Carol or whomever she is in Shapley, shout Caroline. out again, Caroline, she has set that up so it works. So if you feel like, God, the house is so stressful and the dog's causing so much stress and everything's so hard, the world's a lot right now. We get it. We're living in the same world. It's, it's hard. I understand. Try to do something so the dog is less energetic or less stressed or less fearful. And just saying it's okay may not be working because if you tell the dog it's okay and just caress it, was it more confident the next time it happened? And if the dog was not confident or if the dog is showing reactivity or if the dog is just blowing through doorways or the dog has no idea about how a smooth transition can go or you're not conscious of your transitions... Scott and I are in the middle of talking about his Malinois transition going out the door, actually. If those things are not happening, try to change them because I promise you, your house will be calmer. And it gets back to being present. Yes. And that's not easy. And it's, it's not I, easy. We're seeing it with stomach issues, with autoimmune issues, with allergies. Dogs are scratching out of stress and they're getting put on Apoquil and they're getting spots of their coat that are missing because of their stress levels. Stress comes out in various ways, just like people. So try some of these things, think about a few of the things we said, and maybe just troubleshoot. I can implement one little five minute process here and see if things get better. Because the best part of it is there's bleed over into the whole entire existence. And we have more to deal with than most people, which is why we're very confident telling you these things work. If you have one dog that always blows up at the cat, Put the dog in a bedroom that the cat doesn't go into when it's in its crate. Like there's a lot easier ways to manage things than we have to do and think, oh, what room and how and everything else. So make some effort because it will help your lifestyle. It's been nice chatting with you today. <laughs> All right, guys. Chronic stress isn't good for us. It's not good for the dogs. We will be back next week. We got Noel coming back in March. We got a lot of exciting stuff for the next uh, spring and summer. And in the meantime, keep it quirky. <laughs> The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.